So today, uh, we want to do the second part uh, of this unit on writing systems. Um, having spent last time talking mostly about, so to speak, the mechanics of writing technology. Mechanics because we were looking at the ways in which these systems <coughs> evolved, first from pictographic and then from uh, iconic representations and then from uh, <coughs> logographic, uh, logographs and syllabaries and alphabets and so on, how that all uh, took place. Um, why we spend the whole session on that? Well, several reasons. First of all, I'm a linguist and you all have to know that. Um, second of all, uh, this is really not just the earliest instance of one of these situations where you plant a technology uh, in a culture or a technology emerges in a culture and then you have all these questions about how the technology affects the culture and what measure the technology is an agent of change as opposed to, be some, as opposed to something that's integrated with other cultural, <coughs> other cultural factors. It also, um, although we're not going to stress this here, is um, uh, a, a good example of the way technologies emerge. I think of writing a lot on the model of biological evolution. You know, there's these, there are always these arguments against the um, um, <coughs> intelligent design people. Look, if you were going to sit down and design an eye, you would not do it like this, right? You would, you would start out, you would have all just a bunch of protoplasm, you would have built an eye, you would do it a lot more efficiently than that evolution wound up doing it, where you took one thing that was designed for X and you used it for Y and so on and so forth. And this, this process of bricolage, people call it, of, of, um, <coughs> of putting together scraps of things you already have on hand. And writing systems are a lot like that, uh, even to the present day. Why do we write ghosts with an H? Well, because we have this word from Dutch. And we uh, the English writing system, no writing system, is actually rationally designed to be the most efficient way of doing this stuff. It bears this burden of history as it evolved from other things and so on. Um, moreover, um, we'll see that uh, while we'll be talking today about the effect of literacy in writing, it's not itself a topic that's going to leave us. We're going to come back to it in the 17th century, we'll be talking about it um, uh, in the uh, 19th century, even modern times, uh, this question of how literacy itself uh, is incorporated into a society and what its effects are. Um, I'll come back up to another word to say about modern literacy in, in, in a moment. So um, where are we? Well, we moved, you know, 25,000 years, right? That was easy. Uh, and we're, um, <coughs> we're up to the point at which fully developed writing systems are being used uh, in societies. There are now what we can speak of as literate societies. And we want to know what the effect of those is in those societies or how they combine with other things to, um, uh, to create or to, uh, to in, in the process of societal change. I want to put this in a neutral way. Um, <coughs> so what I want to do today is talk, talk first about technological determinism. This is the first sort of the application of the theoretical stuff uh, that Paul was talking about uh, uh, the session before last. Um, then say a word about the, this notion of writing in the stages of culture. What, if we're trying to stage culture, so to speak, if we're trying to set up various levels of development, or it's not clear how to put that, uh, what role would writing play uh, in those? Um, and then we'll come to talking about the consequences of writing, which was the, the, the subject of the homework. Um, consequences of um, say a word about something that follows from the homework, which is this business about the relationship of alphabetic and logographic systems of Greek to Chinese. Um, and then I want to say a bit about the cognitive implications of literacy and whether, in fact, this still holds now, given the technological world, which there are alternative technologies for doing some of the things that only uh, writing could do. Um, <coughs> this idea that changes in a writing system or a method of, uh, of uh, written communication uh, affects society uh, begins in discussing Greeks, and that's what Havelock is concerned. But it just continues right up to the present day. If you look uh, at what people say about texting, for example, it's the end of the world. It's the end of the English language. Um, the English language, the English sentence as we know it, uh, said James Billington, the uh, director of the Library of Congress, is finished because kids have stopped passing notes under their desk in class and started texting each other. That's the end of society. Um, text and instant messaging are negatively affecting students' squat writing quality on a daily basis as they bring their abbreviated language into the classroom. As a result of their electronic chatting, kids are making countless syntax, subject, verb, agreement, and spelling mistakes in writing assignments. See, I didn't have the advantage of texting. I had to make all those spelling mistakes on my own right, when, I, when I was growing up. Um, but this is an American teacher. Um, will text messaging produce generations of illiterates and so on and so forth? Now, you know, the people at ETS say, you know, it's funny. These kids are all spelling you, you know, capital U. But we don't see a lot on the college boards because they're not stupid. Right? Where if you're stupid enough to do that, you don't deserve to go to college. Um, <coughs> but this form of argument is very like the form of argument, in a, in a negative way, that, that Havelock is making. It's been made about writing. It was made uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, about um, word processing. Uh, this on the lower left is a, is a display. It's actually a display of an Osborne. My first computer was, was an Osborne. It was pre, it was pre IBM PC. It was this, they called it, it was before it was called a logo board. It weighed about 18 pounds. It had a screen about four by five inches, and there's a display. And, um, and it had a word processor called WordStar on it that I, that I used. And, um, at that point, this was a little even earlier than 1987, but at that point, um, um, People were saying, oh, word processing is going to change, fundamentally change human uh, cognition. Uh, a philosopher named Michael Hine, in a book called Electric Language, says digital writing invites the formulation of thought directly in the electric element. There's not, a new, there's not, there's not only a new technology available in word processing, but a gradually emerging sense of a new kind of community. And in such a community, psychic life will be redefined. So we had word processors. Um, so <coughs> this form of argument, you keep finding, a, a while ago, a couple years ago, I was looking, I was interested in the, um, when did people first speak of telegraphic style in, in, in writing? Uh, and um, nowadays, you, you don't have to go, you go to the Oxford English Dictionary and it tells you, but the Oxford English Dictionary is very easy to scoop. You go to Google Book and you can find very easily citations for uses that ended by 20 or 50 or 100 years what the Oxford English Dictionary was the first used. So I went to Google Books and I found uh, the first instance of uh, the, 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 the notion of telegraphic style in uh, an article written in 1848, just a few years after the invention of the telegraph, by a man named Conrad Swackhammer. Um, and he wrote uh, that the telegraph required brevity and directness. It forced users to discard the verbosity and complexity of the prevalent English style. And he wrote, the telegraphic style, terse, condensed, expressive, sparing of expletives of extra words, and utterly ignorant of synonyms will propel the English language toward a new standard of perfection, which is where we arrived. Uh, thanks, thanks to the telegraph. 50 years after this, you've got Henry James and Meredith writing the most ponderous, complex English sentences that have ever been written. But uh, this idea that uh, a new technology of communication, new technology of writing, changes the way we think in profound, uh, profound ways is one of the very, uh, both the modern and, and antique antecedents. So um, the importance of this for um, understanding culture itself uh, is evident in, in the amount of attention that's given to people like uh, Goody and Watt, who wrote about this, or, or Havelock, uh, whom you read. Because there's a distinction that people keep trying to make in culture. They want to make stages of culture, but every time they try to impose a certain <coughs> template on cultures, you get into trouble. Or people used to talk, for instance, about primitive societies and advanced or developed societies. A lot of people still talk that way, but it's not, um, among other things, a very helpful way of thinking about things. It really doesn't explain a lot. Never mind that it, it, it impedes understanding of what's going on in, 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 in these societies. Um, so then people began to talk about simple or closed or savage societies. Savage here, more like a French sauvage, a wild, un untamed, not in a sense of ferocious, uh, as opposed to complex or open or domesticated societies, and trying to make the distinction there. Um, this is a distinction, many people would argue, between anthropology and sociology.
And so, uh, and so with other um, uh, distinctions, the difference between prehistory and history. The idea being that it's only when people can talk about themselves and report what they're doing that you have history. That people like Blake can spend years doing dissertations mired in dusty archives, sneezing. Um, uh, so, and that before that, it's only prehistory. Um, and all of this, the story goes, uh, grows out of this fundamental distinction between orality and literacy. What's the importance of literacy? Well, we've been talking about it in, in, um, in uh, uh, what we're talking about in connection with, with Havelock. Um, but the idea is that these are two fundamentally different modes of cultural transmission of carrying, let's say, information um, from one generation to the next, from one stage of culture to the next. Um, so in oral societies, um, uh, information is passed on in this chain of conversation, so to speak. Uh, your parents tell you how to do something, or somebody else tells you how to do something. You pass it on to your kids or to other people, and it's passed on in these interlocking conversations. You have no direct access to any conversations earlier than the one you had. Uh, that, you know, it's the way you learn a lot of things today. I mean, how you learn to play golf or something. You know, your dad taught you something, and you know, that's how you learn. You really don't know how he learned it. You don't have access to those conversations. And most of what we learn, you know, your shoelaces. Right? It's a technology that basically we, you know, it hasn't changed you know, since we had shoelaces. Um, <coughs> so, as, um, as Hamlet writes, uh, in oral culture, storage and transmission between the generations can be carried on only in individual memories. Linguistic information can be incorporated in transmission, transmissible memory only as it obeys two laws of composition. It must be rhythmic and it must be mythical. That's in the reading. What's the, what's the importance of that? Um, Milman Perry was a scholar. Um, the question is, how could Homer have memorized a poem of that length and went around saying it and so on and, and then passed it on to generations of bards who would keep repeating it from memory and, 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 and so forth? Well, Perry went to um, uh, <coughs> areas of, it was, it was, I think it was Serbia, it was in that part of the world, the, 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 the former Yugoslavia, um, where these, these things still exist. Bards would say these, and we'll come to another one at the end of the, the hour. Bards would say these these poems, um, and sometimes thousands of lines long. And what he discovers is that they don't really memorize it. There's a set of rhythmic formulas, metrical formulas, that is to say, very complicated meters, and figures of speech, and patterns, and so on and so forth, and that's what they remember. Um, and, but the wording actually changes considerably, and these things evolve uh, over time. Uh, and the idea is that Homer, presumably on this story, uh, was of the same story. This was something that somebody said, and they were rhythmic, you know, the, the version that got written down whenever it was in the 6th century BC, when it was first written down, was one that had actually been passed down and changed in every generation over, over every set of bards. Um, turns out there are some actually now they found who actually do memorize it. They're the same from one reading to the next. But um, this was a story, and the idea is that for passing on the kind of information about origins, about religions, about who we are, about our genealogy. Um, you need this kind of narrative rhythmic structure. And one more over this narrative, as I say. I mean, it's got to be a story. You know, seeing news, the anger of Achilles, and so on and so forth. As, 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 as it has to be a story about a guy. Tell me a story. Um, <coughs> and if you're going to pass on little smaller bits of wisdom, you're going to do that in the same way, but you'll do it in other formulas. Birds of a feather flock together. You'll have these uh, little, again, narrative stories that follow a certain rhythmic or formal pattern that enable you to remember them and pass, pass them on. And this is the form in which knowledge has to be passed on, uh, as uh, 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 both Goody and Havlock argue, in these societies. Um, so in these cultures, uh, there's no notion of the past as something fixed. The past is just what you heard the last time you were told the myth or told the, uh, the, the, the epic or, or whatever it is. Um, there's no notion, for instance, of a dictionary meaning. If you and I have an argument about the meaning of a word, it's not something that's more likely to happen in a, in a literature than an oral but we can't go to the dictionary. Let's see what Webster says, because there is no Webster. And, and meanings of words themselves can change over time. There's no way to know that this word meant something earlier uh, on this story again. Um, <coughs> the past itself can change um, as we need it to do different things for us in the present. So when the British first went to, um, uh, to, uh, to Nigeria, uh, and they were in the 18, 1940s, 1840s, like, better since I went about that. Uh, they, um, the teeth people uh, told this long story about their origin. There were six brothers, and each brother went to a different part. You know, one of those stories that people have about how their, their people came to be and so on. And um, uh, 40 or 50 years, it was written down. The British weren't really colonial presence at that point. When the British came in and started imposing an administrative structure or something, they went back to these people and they said, well, tell us that story. Oh, well, you see, there were these four brothers. And they said, well, you know, we have these written records here that were made 60 years ago that say there were six, you were saying there were six brothers. They had no memory of anybody having said six brothers. They were four brothers. Why did it change? Well, those stories were not just idle fantasies about the past. They were ways of explaining, let's say, relations among uh, relations of property or relations among kings uh, and genealogies and so on and so forth. And when those changed, they just went back to revise the story. We now have four kings, so there were four brothers to start. So that's the work that these stories are doing. And because they're they're flexible in a way, because they aren't written down, because they can be changed uh, as, as need uh, requires, they do change. Um, so there's no sense um, on this story again of, of, of true history. There's only the story about one's past that one brings to explain uh, whatever's going on in the present. Um, so in the um, <coughs> in the beginning, uh, you begin to get these uh, literate societies when writing systems are developed. As I said last time, and as Havelock makes clear, it isn't as if you just come in and boom, everybody's going to be literate. You can't do what. Uh, uh, what Castro did in Cuba uh, when he came to power in the late 1950s, and you know, the literacy rate in the country went from 15% to 90% of the everybody had it. That wasn't the way it worked. There was a small cast, or class, really a cast of people, um, who understood this technology of writing. Um, and um, I think I have the wrong slides again. This happens to me a lot. All right, but we'll see how it works. Um, yes, okay, you're right. Um, okay. There was a small cast of people uh, with the scribes. Uh, if you were in Egypt, um, you got to be a scribe because your dad was a scribe. It was kind of like getting into Princeton when I was in high school, um, or George Bush was in high school. Um, and um, uh, you went to scribe school. And this was the only activity, by the way, which there were schools in Egypt. You want to become a bricklayer or uh, a carpenter or uh, a weaver. You apprentice, as people did you know, until, until modern times, still do uh, uh, for, for those trades. But to be a scribe, you went to a scribe school. Uh, and you practiced writing on papyrus, um, uh, which Paul will come to next time, uh, until you learned to write. And there were really two systems of writing. There was a, what's called a cursive style. Um, that was a much easier style to write. And that was the one used for record keeping and administrative records and uh, commercial uh, transactions and so on. And then there's what we think of as Egyptian writing, which is hieroglyphic. Uh, this much more complex, semi-logographic, semi-syllabic uh, system that was used for um, writing down laws, for poetry, for religious and liturgical texts, and so on and so forth. And that's the stuff that survives on the walls of tombs because that was where they, you know, those were the places where you had these important things to say. But actually, cursive writing, which was the first one these kids learned, and the easier one was um, uh, was more widely used. And the functions of literacy were um, were fairly restricted to uh, <coughs> initially in sumer, to record keeping and administration and uh, rituals, and, 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 and but, but weren't used very widely. There was nothing like universal or even general literacy of the sort that Havelock's talking about by the by the fifth century
well, today you can just make it aside and literally all the problems, but, but um, the development socially of literacy systems always follows this, this path. And in a certain sense, it's still with us. I mean, we are still, are we still a scri scribal culture? Well, I mean, no, everybody here knows how to read and write, and presumably, my guess is learn to read and write, you know, by three or four, whatever, you were just reading and writing with an illiterate uh, society, I'm going to talk about that at the end of the, uh, of the hour. But in a certain sense, in certain of our writing technologies, we're still something like a scribal culture. Let's suppose I walk in here, and I say, gee, you know, I come to a yard sale, uh, and I got this Dell computer, it's a hard drive, completely white, white clean zone, and this old router. Um, is there somebody here who can help me install Windows and, uh, and connect to the router with Wi-Fi? So how many people can do that for me? Okay, those are leverage hierarchy. Okay, those of you who don't have your hands up, those who have your hands up, you want to make friends with them before the end of, the, of, of, of the semester. Um, this is a skill, and this is an unusual population. I think I mean, that is a, the number of your hands that went up here is probably three or four times the proportion of you know, if I randomly pull people off a bus on University Avenue. Um, uh, that's a, a, so to speak, scribal skill. Uh, there are only a certain number of people. How do we all require some help with? Uh, just to get, you know, I spent the weekend trying to figure out why Gmail was deleting, sending all my income directly into deleting messages, and I finally was over here. So, um, <coughs> but uh, we're all required to deal with this, and, and most of us deal with this not that comfortable. Um, so um, when you get literacy, the idea is. Um, you get fundamental changes in cognition, the way people think about the world. Um, uh, this can uh, follow simply a Jack Glee, who, as I say, written about this in The Domestication of the Savage Mind, gives this example of just making a list. What happens when you can make a list of things? Stuff I have to do today, stuff to get at the supermarket, uh, courses uh, that you need to for, 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 for a degree, whatever. Um, <coughs> people were not going to invite to our party. Uh, you, you, you make a list of things, and all of a sudden you have a, a visual array, and you can imagine rearranging them. Um, you can perceive relationships among them. Um, uh, <coughs> you become aware, as Glee says, of these distinct uh, possibilities of, of order. Um, and this, Glee says, is something that you only get once you have a literate society, this kind of elaborate structure. Now, in fact, um, it isn't clear, and then as Goss kept saying in her essay, you know, it didn't really happen that way and so on, but even in pre literate societies, um, there's some instances in which people obviously have some fairly sophisticated list-making abilities. The most, I'd say the most spectacular of those is the grammarian Panini, a Sanskrit grammarian of the 6th century, uh, I guess we're supposed to say BCE now, BC, um, <coughs> who uh, created a grammar of the Sanskrit language. The Sanskrit language was by then slightly archaic. It was perhaps Elizabethan English to us. It wasn't completely, it wasn't Latinist to us. Um, but it was sufficiently uh, archaic and familiar that they wanted. It was the, 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 the liturgical language of the Vedas, the, the sacred text of the Vedic religion that became the ancestor of modern uh, Hinduism. Uh, was the ancestor of modern Hinduism. Um, and so Panini um, basically wrote a grammar. Of, uh, of uh, Sanskrit. Um, it consisted of, I don't know, 3,950 odd rules of Sanskrit. A highly complex structure. In fact, by far the most sophisticated grammar, descriptive grammar of a language that anybody did until the 20th century. Um, and people still use some of those categories. He categorized all the compound types of, uh, of, 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 of Sanskrit. Compounds are words, you know, like blackboard or um, uh, uh, saber tooth tiger and so on, saber tooth and whatever. And they have different classifications. But we still use the Sanskrit word dvantva, for example, we, meaning we linguists. Dvantva to mean, for example, which means to, to, uh, 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 to, to, to denote compounds like firebomb or something that, where the two words, the thing is both participate in both, uh, both categories and so on. So Pani did this grammar. Um, it isn't written down, and it's in a, it is in a metrical form. Um, it isn't written down until the about 200 years. It's not clear if we don't have records of Pani, but, but from internal evidence from Pani's text, we have a good idea where we live. Um, <coughs> it isn't written down until 200 years later. He may have had some access to Aramaic scripts to help make notes and so on. This is basically a very complex list structured description of a language in a holy oral tradition. Uh, that, that I don't know what Havelock, Havelock knew about Pani. I have no idea what, what he made of it, um, but, but very difficult to accommodate to Havelock's story about, well, not to get right, so you, can do these, you can do these things. Um, nonetheless, the arguments made that um, writing is the technology of the intellect, as Havelock says, uh, that you get that it's fundamentally mediating this transition from the mythical to the logical empirical thought, that it's crucial in the development of history, of logic, of grammar, of philosophy, of, uh, of, 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 of science. Um, all of a sudden, and much as it's true, the past is no longer mutable. All of a sudden, there is a past. You can go back and read Herodotus that was written centuries ago or whatever. You can say, well, this is the story told. And it, hasn't, it isn't like those generations among the teeth that change uh, every time the land boundaries uh, are altered. Um, uh, and that words themselves can be detached from concepts. You can now talk about meanings. You know, I don't think the word means that. I think it means this and so on. So you can have these, these arguments. Is he a socialist? He's not so well. If he's a socialist, he's so on. So you can have those arguments. The argument goes. Uh, those discussions, the argument goes until, until you had right. And finally, it gives you the systematization and the compartmentalization of fields of knowledge. These are all features of our intellectual and cultural life. And Havelock says, look, this all started uh, with the alphabet. So for today's assignment, um, um, wait a second, shoot. Oh, damn, this is all a mess. Um, um, I may be jumping around here. I've got the wrong slides up here. I think I move these around. Um, uh, well, excuse me, give me, give me a second. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, I'm going to do this in a different way. Um, uh, I think this is better, I'm not sure. Um, I'll be jumping around here, these, these are not the right way. Um, okay, let, let me start with the alphabet and then we'll come to the